Yeah, uh, this is just a small a small update about the Osmoswall hardware.git repository. Um, who has noticed this Git repository before? Okay, at least half of the people. Um, yeah, it's indeed, um, it's uh, still rather small, um, but basically, I mean, the problem is we have like smaller boards and you don't want to have a separate Git, rep Git repository for each of them or a separate Redmine project and so on. It just is uh, too much overhead for some small boards that uh, we happen to have built over the time. Um, so uh, actually it started two, no, three years ago now with the multi-voltage UART and the mini PCI breakout board. Um, uh, and uh, we just have four new projects uh, in 2018 that I would like to talk a little bit about uh, here. So this is unlikely going to fill the entire 30 minute time slot, but uh, I just wanted to introduce uh, this to you. So the multi-voltage UART, that's the old, one of the older projects, uh, was basically because I was so annoyed that uh, you know, every time you analyze or you, you play with some embedded device, uh, there's a different voltage, uh, particularly if you play with cellular modems. Um, they seem to have UARTs at odd logic levels, like 2.7 volts or, you know, um, uh, uh, really strange voltages. Um, sometimes also you have some ARM system on a chips that have even less than 1.8, I think 1.5 volts I've seen once as a logic level voltage. And um, so this is basically a, a USB UR chip, it's a normal uh, Scilabs uh, CP2105, I think. Um, but uh, the the uh, different part is that you have this adjust this switch where you can select which of the voltage you want, and you can also actually feed the voltage to it. So if you have a target that operates, let's say, at 2.0 volts, um, then you can actually feed the 2.0 volt to the multi-voltage UART, and it will then uh, use that as a logic voltage um, and not uh, use any fixed voltage there, uh, but just follow uh, the target voltage. Um, yeah, the second uh, project was this uh, mini PCIe breakout uh, board, uh, which uh, also uh, came about when uh, we wanted to play with some of the GSM modems um, that um, uh, are available in this form factor, which are normally installed in some embedded devices, some routers or older laptops and so on. Um, and um, if you look at actually the data sheets of the modems, quite, of, quite a number of them expose signals that are not uh, standardized on the MPCIe connector. So um, uh, we have this header over here at the right hand side uh, where we expose all of the uh, unused um, pins on the MPCIe connector um, and some modems, uh, for example, they expose a PCM bus there or even expose analog audio and so on and using this breakout board, you not only you have sort of a, a USB socket to, to MPCIe slot adapter, but you also have all these additional signals here on a header and a SIM card slot and you have some SMA to UFL adapters, uh, which are basically just, you know, five millimeters of trace on the board here. So you can have jumper cables from the, uh, from the modem uh, to the UFL socket on the board and then you have uh, strain relief uh, SMA connections for antennas or, or cable connections or whatever else. Um, yeah, and now we're coming to the new stuff. This is the Osmo SFP breakout board, um, which uh, maybe Sylvain uh, wants to say something about how this came about. Um, just hand over the microphone. Yeah. Um, okay, never mind. Um, so, Basically, I wanted to play with uh, those. Uh, originally, I wanted to play with just optical fiber in general uh, to transmit signals uh, back and forth. And um, because you know, SFP transceivers are a commodity you can buy very cheaply on eBay. The goal was to see, okay, what can we use them for uh, potentially other than transmitting Ethernet and plugging them into a switch? Uh, and so we just just to play with around with them, we needed uh, some way to interface uh, with them and so uh, uh, those uh, those two boards um, uh, that's why they were created so there are two versions um, one that exposes the uh, differential pair directly so in, in case you don't know SFP um, you know you have a differential pair for transmit a differential pair for receive and then a bunch of uh, control signals like uh, Loss of signal, uh, an I squared C bus, so you can talk to an embedded EEPROM or uh, or even a microcontroller inside uh, and on, on some of them, um, that kind of stuff. And so all the low speed and control signal are broken out to just a standard 0.1 inch header. 
And then on one of the board, the differential pair is exposed as, uh, as, a, as a, a SMA directly on the edge. Uh, that's the board on the picture here. Um, so for instance, you could connect that to an FPGA board that also has SMA and multi-gigabit transceiver if you want to try to do some uh, high-speed communication. Um, one thing I wanted to try with that board was uh, uh, sniffing uh, or talking uh, CPRI to uh, you know radio heads and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and I bought a ECP5 5G board which uh, has exactly those connectors and is also available cheaply. And also uh, Noah has an open source tool chain so you don't even have to use the vendor tools if you don't want to. And uh, then there is uh, another board which has uh, trans, uh, yeah, um, LVDS to CMOS, you know, standard logic 3.3 volt uh, converters um, embedded, um, and this is to try to transmit um, other signals or talk to a microcontroller. Because what we found out is that those uh, SFP they have a minimum speed because everything is AC coupled, but that minimum speed it's not you know, one gigabit you, or even 100 megabits. You can send one megabit if you want on them. And uh, one application that I um, actually uh, did with this is uh, transmit a 10 megahertz reference clock um, inside, distributed inside my apartment uh, using optical fiber rather than using um, coax. And so you just feed the 10 megahertz to one of the uh, input and you get 10 megahertz at the output uh, and you can use an optical splitter to, to split it and that kind of stuff and uh, that works just fine. I haven't um, done any characterization of the phase noise yet. Uh, that might depend on the actual SFP, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, but I would expect that the close-in phase noise wouldn't be too much affected. There might be uh, some higher frequency uh, ones, but that shouldn't... I mean, the instrument that you lock it to is going to have its own PLL inside, and so the the, um, uh, the loop of that PLL is going to be the, the determinant factor for the uh, IO noise anyway. So I don't think that's going to be too much of an issue. And, um, and so, yeah, if you want to play with SFP, uh, pick one up and try stuff. Yeah, so... Um, one thing that just came to my mind is, uh, do you use it uh, only point-to-point -point, uh, for the 10 megahertz distribution, or do you actually use optical splitters for multiple receivers? No, so far, I've only used it point-to-point uh, oh, yeah. so, so point because I, uh, I have a, an optical splitter in my to-buy list, but I, I don't have enough items to justify the shipping yet uh, from, uh, from the company. I usually buy all my optical stuff. Uh, so, yeah, definitely something I want to try. Because um, a lot... At least on some of the SFP I'm using, I actually have to use uh, an attenuator because the, the distances are just too short and they're meant to talk to like 10 kilometers lengths because I'm using single mode fibers. And so I, I actually need attenuators so I don't saturate the receiver. <laughs> yeah, one. Can't you, pr um, using the pins there, is there no way to program the uh, amplifier or the attenuation itself on the SFPs? Yeah, most, oh. most, uh, yeah. The SFP that I use are the old ones uh, made for, uh, I think, 155 megabits or something, and it's really just a dumb UART on them. And actually, I have some that don't have anything connected to the i 2 c pin at all. Like, they're meant for some specific application or something, but yeah. Only the more recent 10 gigabit ones have a more advanced function, uh, like the digital DDM, DDM, I think it's called, the uh, monitoring thing, which is a bit more advanced than just identification. Um, but I'm not aware of any standard, at least, to send commands or anything like that. Yeah, so um, this also, uh, this idea about splitting it, uh, I think, is rather nice. Uh, and it's also what's used in these fiber LNBs, actually. I mean, uh, right, it's the same strategy. You have uh, a fiber optic LNB at the satellite dish, which then feeds uh, analog RF uh, modulated over, uh, uh, over the, the fiber optic signal. Um, and then you have passive splitters, and then you can distribute it uh, among an apartment block or something like that. And for the 10 megahertz, of course, uh, you could use exactly the same strategy uh, there. Okay, so I'm I'm now have yeah. Anyway, building integrated timing buses and things like that. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so. 
the se so the first one, the breakout board, is the one that doesn't have the uh, the LVDS transceivers where the uh, uh, the signals are exposed directly, um, and you have to feed a differential signal. And the S Osmo SFP experimenter is the board that has the LVDS transceivers on board, the transmitter and the receiver. Um, before we did this, I actually did some research and I could only find one commercially available board for a ridiculous amount of money. I don't know what it was, like $300 or something, you know, it's like for, you know, it's just a couple of parts and a connector on a board. Um, but now actually I found that uh, around the same time somebody else also did uh, a similar board, but uh, he used um, um, basically transformers. So he was not using uh, any digital circuit, but he was actually using um, like RF transformers here to do the, the balancing, unbalancing. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's uh, otherwise it's basically the same use case. So this is uh, Sylvain's uh, prototype board uh, picture that he made where things are actually connected. So you see the, the SFP transceiver is uh, slided into the connector and here you have SMA signals receiving and uh, uh, driving uh, the SFP. Okay, another board um, that we made is the Osmocom clock generator, um, which is basically just a, a small breakout board for the C Labs SE5351C, uh, which is a software programmable clock generator chip. Um, and uh, we have a microcontroller next to it so we can program that programmable clock generator. Um, unfortunately, I made a poor design choice when choosing the initial part. I thought, okay, let's, uh, let's use the smallest possible microcontroller uh, that we can find, which still has a Cortex-M on there. And I chose the 807011, uh, which turned out to be a bit too constrained. So we will upgrade to a larger uh, microcontroller on the next version of the board. Um, and we have a small EEPROM uh, to store uh, settings um, and we can control it over UART um, and so on. The, the board looks like this, um, if you look at it. So uh, the point is that you here in clock in, you, you feed in a clock signal um, and you have the eight outputs here, four on the back, four on the front side. All of them are exposed both uh, via UFL and over SMA. So you have, can choose either you have internal pigtails or something or you have uh, SMA connectors. And uh, this is, I think, um, uh, Dimitri uh, requested uh, SPI and I2C. Uh, so you can control some additional peripherals. So we put this UX connector here. UX is a de facto standard from Olimex uh, for uh, connecting microcontroller boards with all kinds of peripherals. Of course, the obligatory Osmocom UART connector uh, with a 2.5 millimeter check. This here is a tag connect um, for single wire debug. Um, uh, this footprint here and USB and uh, power supply. So you can either supply over USB, I think, or over the, um, the external uh, jack here. Um, and here's only one output is populated on this board um, that has been photographed here. Uh, we also have put an a VCO CXO, a voltage controlled crystal oscillator here, but um, that was just because there was space on the circuit board and I thought, okay, well, let's, and I had the library for the footprint already, so I thought, okay, let's, <laughs> let's put it there. Um, it might be removed on the second version because we need more space for the microcontroller and Dita wants to have a CPLD on it. So um, <clears throat> uh, there might be some changes. So why did we need this board or what's the use case? Well, the use case is primarily, um, as you know, if you operate GSM or any kind of cellular signal, you need rather stable clock source uh, because the, the tolerance requirements are very uh, uh, stringent and very, very close, very tight. Um, and um, so, uh, and, and a lot of boards don't accept like a 10 megahertz reference. So if you buy a GPS discipline oscillator or some other clock reference, whether it's a rubidium or whatever, you usually have a 10 megahertz output, but then you have some whatever SDR and it needs 30.72 megahertz or it needs 40 megahertz like the Lime SDR mini. Um, and then you need something in between that can generate you the clock frequency that this specific SDR board needs from the 10 megahertz reference that your uh, reference uh, clock source has. And that's uh, why um, uh, we created this board, uh, a little bit inspired by some other people who have done a similar approach and also um, the HackRF uses uh, almost the same, or is it the same? No, I think it's a different. It's exactly the same um, uh, chip uh, to generate as its internal clock generator, um, this uh, SI uh, chip. Um, so, sorry? 
Okay, so there was a comment that the Air Spy uh, might also use the same uh, clock generator. And uh, it turned out, after some more research, uh, that uh, Dimitri already also had uh, played with that uh, chip um, uh, and basically integrated a, a hack RF in, in uh, a larger device uh, um, where he basically uses the, the only the clock generator of the hack RF, if I understand correctly. Uh, but uh, he can comment uh, on that a little bit. Um, Thank you. So I needed uh, exactly the same, uh, solved exactly the same problem with clock, uh, multi generating multiple clock signals. And the uh, easiest thing I was uh, uh, done or did uh, to, uh, back at the time was to just uh, reuse the hacker F for purpose of clock generating, which I just uh, added a wire to a free pin and got a second channel which then goes over to this uh, um, on the lower left corner, uh, lower right corner by ST. Yeah, so it uh, enter, adds the clock, generated clock to the coax and um, this is being fed to LNB modified uh, to take this uh, clock and so essentially we achieve uh, a stable clock for the low noise block or low noise converter this way and I mean the hacker F just takes uh, a lot of space and has only a maximum of two clocks even with modification so I will be happy to uh, re replace it with the Osmo clock again and yeah by the way the software is running we tested SPI we tested SQRC we tested UART um, and uh, now the next uh, thing will be to just move to the SMD21 um, and yeah, the repository is already available at the state as it is, but we will add some changes uh, to the software for the migration to the bigger CPU. Yeah, so that's the clock generator board. Uh, any questions about that before I move to the next board? Nope. Um, Why does DJ want a CPU? <laughs> for lower clocks. So Dita is doing a lot of experiments with ISDN these days, like building your own NTBA and things like that. And um, uh, there you need, I think, something like 4 kilohertz or 8 kilohertz reference signals that need to be very precise if, again, you want to drive, let's say, a GSM base station at the end of the line. Um, but you need rather low clocks. Uh, so he thought it would be nice to have a CPUD more or less as a programmable divider. <laughs> so you can generate clocks that are lower than the minimum output frequency of the chip uh, that we use. Uh, I have a question to the public. Uh, so we have also USB running, but at the moment it's a USB um, like uh, human interface device. Uh, what would you like? Would you have uh, like to have a USB uh, CDC instead? So you have like uh, a serial serial port via USB, or because uh, this human interface device thing would require uh, utilities or control. But uh, Harald suggested to just use a serial uh, over USB, so you have like command line interface. And I'm tending uh, towards this idea. The more I think about having a yeah, I dedicated control utility just to add uh, some numbers, so. If, if you have the, if you have the code size, yeah, the, the computation, uh, yeah. If you have the register, the the size in the SMD to do all the computation of which the register value and stuff, yeah. Okay. It's always nice to be able to open Minicom and program all your output frequency without having, like if, if you're on the field or something, you know, reprogramming something, you might not have the laptop with the exact control utility that you have and stuff like that, you know, so. Yeah, one suggestion would be then to use uh, a standard like uh, SCPI, like interfacing a real uh, signal generator. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. But th then, uh, but <laughs> you probably know <laughs> what I want to say, but there is even, I think, uh, Linux is, uh, like a USB standard for uh, instrument. TMC? Yeah, t uh, test and measurement control class. So then if I, <laughs> then I, I certainly not uh, going to use serial port, but then I have to inter implement TMC. You can always leave that as an exercise to the user. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, um, yeah, I just think it's it's amazing that somebody sacrifices an entire hacker if just for the clock generator. I think that's uh, um, quite uh, interesting. Okay, so then we had this. It's a hacker with serial number one. It's a hacker with serial number one. Kindly provided by Osman. Osman. Kindly provided by Michael Osman. Okay, so. Um, yeah, uh, so we had this uh, clock generator board and another use case that we had at Sysmocom was to convert clocks. Um, so uh, a lot of references are, uh, for example, sign references um, uh, and uh, some boards need a square input. Uh, so you need something that uh, squares the clock signal and just using a Schmidt trigger or something like that, you have lots of jitter and there's some specified uh, chips that are basically low jitter um, uh, devices that convert a sine clock into a square clock. So we built this other board where, um, and uh, as you can see, it's open source hardware, of course, uh, where you have uh, two inputs. You can either have a single-ended or differential input for your input uh, clock in sine, and you have two um, outputs uh, where you get a square signal, and you can control, uh, or depending on the chip you place, there's two different chips uh, in pin-compatible package, you can either have two in-phase or two 180 degrees uh, uh, shifted uh, inverted output signals, basically. Um, and as you can see, it's in the same form factor, which brings me to the next slide, I believe. Um, uh, about this form factor, so the idea was to have the boards always, uh, like these clock-related utility boards, uh, always uh, 10 centimeters wide. Um, so from left to right, that's 100 millimeters, which uh, is basically as wide as a Euro PCB, which is uh, 100 by 160. Um, and uh, that means we can, for example, use these 19-inch uh, uh, racks where you, with three units where you can slide in lots of those boards uh, if you need multiple of them and you want to have some uh, more sophisticated uh, clock setup. Or you can find these uh, uh, milled, no, sorry, it's actually extruded aluminum enclosures, which also are designed originally for Euro PCBs. Um, and you can just slide, this is again 10 centimeters wide, you can slide or slot in like one, two, three of those boards on top of each other and you can even on the back side you can do the same with more boards. And that's also why all the connectors of those boards are always on the long edge, um, so uh, to fit this kind of uh, enclosure form factor. So um, I think uh, uh, if we continue like this for another 10 years, then we will have something like a um, modular synthesizer, uh, but not for music, but for <laughs> clocks. <laughs> um, and you can put the, the modules all in one enclosure. Yeah, and these are the links about the respective projects. So if anyone wants to uh, hack on that, uh, feel free to join in. Um, any questions at this point? No. Good. Um, so the the uh, all the design files are published. Anyone can build the boards, of course. Um, for the mature projects, uh, we also always build a few and put them in the Sysmocom webshop. Um, and uh, for the clock-related uh, boards, for the uh, clock generator and clock converter, that didn't happen yet, um, but it will happen eventually. So I think the converter we can actually start already now. There's nothing that needs to be changed. But as I said, the clock generator, we still want to go for another microcontroller. So there will be another spin before we build more boards and uh, make them available uh, for people who don't like to order boards and solder them and so on, which uh, always eats time. Okay, yeah, then thanks for your attention.